Thank you very much, Claire, and good morning to everybody. Morning. It's a pleasure to have you know this first uh, discussion about uh, the drivers uh, of post-pandemic inflation. Uh, this paper, uh, the author is uh, Giorgio Primicieri, prof professor of Northwestern University, and uh, the, co the co-author is Domenico Giannone from the International Monetary Fund. And our discussant will be Fernanda, from Vice President of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. So without uh, further ado, okay. if you want to, you have the floor. You know, 25 minutes for you, 15 minutes for you, you know perfectly, you know the housekeeping rules. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm gonna talk to you about uh, the recent run-up in inflation, uh, its drivers, uh, and some of the difficult trade-offs faced by the European Central Bank. And this is joint work with Domenico Giannone, who works for the IMF. So I should uh, stress that the views in the paper and the presentations are simply our own and do not necessarily reflect those uh, of the IMF. So I will organize my presentation around the following four questions. The first question is about whether the recent behavior of inflation has been similar in the US and the Euro area. The second question is what caused the recent surge of inflation in both of these economies? Third, what would have happened if the ECB had tried to keep inflation closer to the 2% target? And the fourth and final question is about the current outlook for inflation and monetary policy in the Euro area. Let me give you a very quick preview of the answers to this question before getting into the details of the, uh, of the presentation. As it is perhaps fairly well known, the answer to the first question is a strong yes. In fact, not only headline inflation, but also many of its components have been nearly identical in the US and the Euro area. And so given the similarities in the behavior of inflation, you might imagine that also the causes might be similar, and in fact they are. According to our results, the main driver of inflation has been unexpectedly strong aggregate demand, not just in the US, but also in the Euro area. And um, um, we also find that uh, adverse supply shocks have been important. But these unfavorable supply conditions have been much more important for output uh, as a negative drag on output uh, rather than causing inflation. And so given that output was already weakened by these unfavorable supply conditions, if the ECB had tried to stabilize inflation <clears throat> further than what they did, this would have caused a very substantial output loss uh, hampering the already anemic recovery. So when it comes to the fourth question, the one about the outlook for inflation and monetary policy in the euro area, our model gives us reasons of optimism, both in the short run and in the medium run. In the short run, because we forecast a relatively smooth path back to the inflation target in the euro area economy. In the medium run, because we find that the ECB has not suffered from any loss of credibility from the recent spike in inflation in 2021, 2022. So let me get to the uh, body of the presentation. I'm gonna start by focusing on the first question. And more generally, in order to set the stage, I wanna compare the economic experience of the US and the Euro area since the beginning of the pandemic. And I wanna start actually from something that wasn't that similar between the two economies, which is the behavior of real activity. This is a simple plot of real GDP in the US, the solid line on the left-hand side, and Europe, Euro area, in the, on the right-hand side. Uh, both of these GDP measures have been normalized to be equal to zero in the last quarter of 2019. The dashed and dotted lines represent various types of pre-COVID projections made by the ECB, by the Fed, by the Survey of Professional Forecasters. Now, to be clear, 
we should not interpret those dashed and dotted lines as measures of potential output, because we know that during the COVID period, both economies, the US and the Euro area, were hit by severe supply shocks that have limited the productive capacity of both economies. So these are simply best guesses about the most likely behavior of GDP made before knowing anything about the devastating impact of, uh, of COVID. And relative to these projections, we see that the recession in the Euro area was more severe than in the US, and the recovery was slower. So that's the first set of stylized facts. Here is a second set of stylized facts concerning uh, energy prices. We have two plots. The, on the left-hand side, we plot price inflation for household utility energy. The red line, uh, household utility energy prices are basically the price of electricity and gas. Uh, the red line corresponds to the euro area, the blue line to the US, and as it is well known, the price of electricity and gas has increased a lot more in the euro area relative to the US, probably because of the larger impact in Europe of uh, Russians' um, invasion of Ukraine. On the other hand, on the right hand side, we have another component uh, equally important of energy, which is transportation energy. These are basically motor fuels, gasoline, essentially. And here, the opposite happened. The price of gasoline increased a lot more in the US relative to Europe. So quite interestingly, when you put together these two components of energy prices to compute an aggregate measure of energy price, you get a very similar behavior of aggregate energy price inflation in the US and the Euro area. It's not identical, but it's extremely similar. The third set of stylized facts concern broader measures of inflation. On the left-hand side, we have headline inflation, the red line for Europe, based on HICP inflation, which is the most widely monitored measure of prices in, uh, in Europe. The blue line corresponds to the CPI in the US with a little adjustment. We took out the rent imputation of owner-occupied residences because the HICP does not include any rent imputation, so this makes them extremely comparable. And as we can see on the left panel, the two lines are nearly identical except for an approximate six months delay with which inflation has peaked in the euro area relative to the US. On the right hand side, we have a measure of inflation excluding energy, which again is extremely similar in the two regions. Not surprisingly, because headline inflation is very similar, energy inflation is very similar, so inflation excluding energy is also very similar. And to reinforce the similarities in the inflation experience in the two regions, the bottom graph plots separately inflation for goods and services in the euro area and the US. And again, they look like the mirror image of each other, except for the usual phase shift. So we have an answer to the first question, where the behavior of inflation similar in the US and Europe Yes, they were nearly identical. So we can focus on the causes now. So the conventional view, which is grounded in monetary theory, tells us that central banks should respond quite vigorously to demand shocks. Because these shocks increase output, they increase prices, they don't create any trade-off. Instead, central banks should look through or accommodate supply shocks especially if these shocks are temporary, especially if these shocks do not involve the second round effects, because these shocks create a trade-off. They increase prices and they reduce output. And so given the difference in the optimal response to demand and supply shocks, what we did in the paper was decomposing the recent behavior of economic activity and prices into a supply and demand component. And we did it using a very simple statistical model of the joint evolution of quantities and prices, identifying a demand component and a supply component of the recent experience of inflation and output. Uh, and uh, uh, the results of this decomposition are in this graph. I'm going to spend a minute on this graph because it's one of the most important graphs of the paper. We have the US on the left hand side and Europe or the Euro area on the right-hand side. GDP is on the first row, 
and the year on year inflation based on the HICP for Europe and the CPI for the US is in the bottom row. And uh, the, dash, the solid line represents the actual realization of the data. The dashed line instead are the pre-COVID projections. What the model does, the model interprets the reasons why the actual data turned out to be different from the forecast in terms of demand or supply surprises. Demand surprises correspond to the yellow bars, while uh, supply surprises are the green bars. And as we can see, you know, the model tells us, the estimated model, that adverse supply conditions have constrained economic activity, very much so, but have had a relatively limited effect on inflation. Inflation, instead, seems to be driven largely by demand factors, about two-thirds of inflation, not only in the US, but perhaps especially in Europe, seems to be driven by unexpectedly strong demand. Now, this result is extremely robust in the paper. I've shown you the result here based on a very simple model with just two variables, but we obtain exactly the same results using different measures of prices, different measures of quantities, distinguishing between goods and services, uh, introducing energy prices in the model, distinguishing between transportation energy and household energy, introducing interest rates. Uh, so it's very robust. What makes it interesting is that this is also a fairly surprising result. Well, to be honest, it was surprising to Domenico and I when we first started the project because our prior was aligned with the conventional view. And the conventional view at that point was that demand factors were more important in the US but less so in Europe where inflation was more, mostly driven by um, adverse supply conditions. And so given that this result is very robust for us, and it's also surprising, I want to spend the next three or four minutes giving you some economic intuition for why we think it makes a lot of economic sense. And I want to do it using the most basic uh, supply and demand logic. So let's consider the following diagram that has inflation on the vertical axis and GDP in deviations from its deterministic trend on the horizontal axis. The lower diamond represents the position of the euro area economy before COVID in 2019, where um, GDP was approximately at its deterministic trend and inflation was roughly at the target of 2%, a little below. But the second diamond, the one on top, instead represents the position of the euro area economy at the peak of the inflation cycle in the fourth quarter of 2022 when inflation was approximately 10% and output was roughly 2%, 2 percentage points, 2% below trend, the deterministic trend. Now, this is the positively sloped supply curve in 2019 that must have shifted to the left by 2022. This is completely in line with the conventional view that there were adverse supply conditions hitting both of the US and the euro area economy, particularly the euro area economy. So now the question becomes, to what extent this left shift of the aggregate supply alone can explain an eight percentage points increase in inflation? And as you might imagine, the answer to this question depends entirely on the slope of the aggregate demand, which is not in this graph yet. And the slope of the aggregate demand is endogenous to policy. For example, you know, the stronger a central bank reacts to inflationary pressures, the less it tolerates deviations of inflation from the 2% target, the flatter is the aggregate demand. So let me analyze two extreme cases. These are not representative of the US or the Euro area economy. These are just extreme cases to make a, a theoretical point. So the first case I want to analyze is the case of a central bank that reacts so strongly to inflationary pressures that effectively it conducts policy based on the principle of strict inflation targeting. The aggregate demand curve in this framework would be exactly horizontal. Of course, this is extreme. But if the demand curve is, is horizontal, a left shift, a contraction in supply is gonna create a massive impact on output, but zero effect on inflation. In, in order to rationalize the observed high level of inflation, the aggregate demand curve must have shifted upward in this economy. 
capturing uh, you know, demand shocks that are either accommodated or engineered as monetary shocks by the monetary authority. The opposite extreme case, so in this case, inflation would be entirely demand driven. The opposite extreme case is a case of a central bank that reacts extremely weakly to inflationary pressures, where the aggregate demand curve is nearly vertical. In this case, I don't need to move the aggregate demand anymore. The simple left shift of the aggregate supply is enough to rationalize the high level of inflation. And in this extreme case, inflation will be entirely supply driven. So neither of these extreme cases, a nearly horizontal or a nearly vertical aggregate uh, demand, obviously accurately represent the US and, uh, and the euro area economy. So the question is, whether the aggregate demand in these real economies, the US and the Euro area, whether aggregate demand is closer to being horizontal or closer to being vertical. And if you think about it, it's got to be flat. It's got to be closer to be horizontal. Because while it is true that neither the Fed nor the ECB are strict inflation targeters, it is also true that over the last two or three decades, both central banks, and luckily so, have established themselves as a reputation of strong inflation fighters. And therefore, you should not be surprised if I tell you that our estimates of the slope of the aggregate demand in the euro area economy is this. By the way, uh, previous work by Silvana Tenrero with McClay for the US before COVID in a completely different context found a very similar result for the US, very flat aggregate demand curve. So if this is the case, and the demand curve is so flat, the increase in inflation will be only partly attributed to a shift in aggregate supply. But for the large part, we will need an upward, <coughs> sorry, an upward shift in the aggregate demand to explain the eight percentage points increase in inflation. And this is the economic intuition for why our results find that inflation is largely demand driven. Now, I want to, before moving on to the third question, the one about counterfactual exercises, I want to reconcile this view of inflation being demand driven with the reduced form evidence that the increase in energy prices contributed a lot to headline inflation in, um, in the US, but also especially in the Euro area. And the way we addressed this question was by augmenting our model with a measure of energy prices and trying to identify three sources of variation now. Demand disturbances, non-energy supply disturbances, and energy supply disturbances. And the results of this exercise are in this, uh, in this graph. As usual, the US are on the left, and uh, the euro area is on the right. The first row corresponds to GDP, then non-energy inflation, and then energy inflation. And what we see here is that energy supply shocks, the fact that energy prices increased probably in Europe a little bit more than we expected, they did contribute negatively to economic activity, especially in Europe. This is the purple area. However, demand remains the key driver of inflation, not only of non-energy inflation, as I showed you before, but also of energy inflation. In other words, the reconciliation between the uh, inflation being demand-driven and the accounting evidence that energy prices contributed to overall inflation is simply that energy prices too are endogenous and were largely moved by um, aggr strong aggregate demand. And the similarity between the behavior of energy prices in the US and Europe is further supporting that, uh, uh, that view. So let me turn now to the third question, which is what would have happened if the ECB had tried to counteract, uh, to mitigate these uh, uh, demand-driven inflationary pressures, to keep inflation closer to 2%. The way we're gonna address this question is by introducing interest rates now in our model. We're gonna introduce a measure of the short-term interest rate, the one-year rate, and we're going to simulate uh, um, a bunch of counterfactual ECB policy scenarios. We're gonna focus on three of these scenarios. 
an early tightening scenario, a lean against demand scenario, and the extreme scenario of strict inflation targeting, which is probably not realistic uh, to, to implement in, in, in real time, but just as a, as a benchmark. So let's start with a tighten earlier scenario. The results of this counterfactual analysis are in this graph. The top left graph is GDP in the euro area. This is the solid dotted line. On the right hand side, we have HICP year on year inflation. And on the bottom part of the graph, we have interest rates. The red line are actual data. The olive lines are the counterfactual experiment. So the olive line tells us how these variables would have evolved if the ECB had started increasing interest rates one year earlier. Not by more, simply earlier. And we can see from the graph on the right that inflation would have increased less, about three percentage points less, but also output would have been lower than actual. On average, by 1%, and at the peak of the distance between the red and the olive line, by 2%. Let me turn to the second counterfactual, which is the lean against demand. So we saw earlier in the presentation that according to our results, most of the rise in inflation was due to unexpectedly strong demand. So what if the ECB had neutralized the effect of these demand forces on inflation? What would have happened? And uh, what would have happened is represented by the turquoise uh, line in these graphs. Again, the red line is the actual realization of the data. So we see from the bottom graph that in order to achieve that target, the ECB would have had to tighten earlier and buy more. Interest rates would have um, increased by more. From the graph on the right, we see that inflation would have also increased a lot less. Not surprisingly, because we're killing all of the demand disturbance, the effect of demand disturbance is on inflation, and inflation is mostly demand driven. So inflation would have been much lower. But very importantly, on the top left graph, we see that output would have tanked, essentially. Output would have been up to five or six percent lower than actual, and actual output was already weakened by weak supply conditions. So this would have hampered and would have uh, been very costly in terms of output and hampered the recovery. And the third counterfactual is a strict inflation targeting. Again, this is an extreme reference point in which the ECB uh, raises interest rates so much earlier to keep inflation at 2%, actually at its historical average here, which is slightly below 2%. And there's very little difference between these last two counterfactuals because inflation is mostly demand driven, so keeping it at 2% or killing the demand shocks is essentially the same. So an inflation targeting strategy would have created uh, an equally severe recession, if not more. So let me turn to the final, uh, oops, sorry, to the final question, which is a question about the current outlook for inflation and monetary policy in the euro area. The way we're going to address this question is by simply taking our model and projecting the model forward, computing some model-based forecast for the next few quarters. So these are the actual data for GDP on the left-hand side, HICP here on year inflation on the center panel, and the one-year interest rate on the right-hand side, all for the euro area. And these are the forecasts produced by our model, the dashed dotted line for the next six or seven quarters. We can see three things. From the center panel, we see that the path back to inflation target is fairly smooth according to this forecast. Most of it is done. On the left panel, the panel about GDP, we see that the model predicts some growth in GDP, but a relatively moderate one. And so with inflation under control in the center panel, or forecasted to be under control, and a moderate forecasted growth for GDP, the model also predicts that interest rates should gradually decline. In essence, the model is expecting the ECB to continue easing as it has started to do so already in the last uh, uh, policy meeting. The last graph I'm gonna show you is a comparison between this forecast produced by our model and the forecast of professional forecasters in Europe. 
which are represented by the green asterisks here. And as you can see, they are very, very, very close. So for us, for Domenico and us, <laughs> and I, this was reassuring. This is a nice uh, cross-check. It's a nice external validation of the model. It's also well, quite remarkable, if I, I'm not French, but uh, <laughs> it's remarkable because uh, the model does not use any information about the survey of professional forecasters. And so a priori, it wasn't obvious at all that the two forecasts uh, are so close. But now more seriously, this is, uh, um, it's very interesting that they are similar for the following reason. Our model is estimated exclusively using pre-COVID data. Therefore, the forecast produced by our model reflect pre-COVID transmission of monetary policy, and especially pre -COVID, uh, the pre-COVID reaction function, the pre-COVID conduct of monetary policy. The fact that the survey of professional forecasters projections are so similar means that essentially the public is expecting a return to the standard pre-COVID conduct of monetary policy. And this means that the ECB has not suffered from any loss of uh, credibility, any scar from the peak on inflation of the last couple of years. And so these were my four questions. Were the US and the Euro area inflation experience similar? Yes. What caused it? It was mostly unexpectedly strong demand. If the ECB had tried to keep inflation lower, closer to 2%, it would have created a very substantial output loss. And the outlook now seems pretty um, optimistic, to, according to the model that we use in, the, in this research. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Giorgio, for you know, very clear, insightful, and uh, I think that you, you are going to stir up a lot of discussion <laughs> afterwards. You will see it. Uh, but now, you know, our first discussion is going to be Fernanda. Fernanda, you have the floor. Hmm? Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation and the opportunity to read this great paper. Um, everything that I say here today are my own views and not those of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, neither the uh, the Fed system. So I'll split my presentation in two parts. Uh, I'll start by providing you a short summary of uh, the paper, and Georgia just did a great job presenting, so this is gonna be really short. And then I'm gonna raise a few comments and suggestions, and maybe some food for thought for future research uh, based on their results. Um, so the authors start by stating a few facts. Uh, two of them are that the US and the Euro area faced similar inflation dynamics since the pandemic. And the two pictures here are, are basically showing that. The Euro era recovery, however, was relatively more sluggish than the one in the US. Based on these two facts and motivated by these two facts, they go ahead and estimate on a statistical model in trying to understand what are the drivers behind these patterns. And they point to three uh, key results. First, demand shocks seem to be the main drivers of inflation, both in the Euro area and in the US. Supply disruptions are behind the Euro area's slower recovery. And uh, towards the end, they also talk about how the ECB accommodation uh, policy substantially contributed to the Euro area recovery. This picture is the same that Georgia showed you before, but it's a great summary of the main points of the paper. Uh, and I'll focus on the two main results first and then turn to the last one and talk about the role of the ECB on the accommodation, uh, on the recovery of the economy. Um, looking at this picture, I'm gonna focus on the two bottom uh, charts. They are showing US and Euro area inflation and splitting the contributions between demand and supply shocks. And as you can see, demand shocks seem to be the main driver of inflation here, right? The yellow bars are the main contributors of inflation both in the US and in the Euro area. One interesting uh, thing about this that I'm gonna be highlighting uh, in a few slides is that if you compare the contributions of demand, they are not only uh, bigger than supply, 
for inflation, but they are also very similar in the US and the Euro area. And if not, the contribution of demand shocks in the Euro area seem to be a tad larger, actually, than in the US. So how, do we, uh, how can we make sense of this? Well, the authors actually provide a very nice Econ 101 picture of what is behind or the intuition behind their results. And the argument, the argument follows both the US and the Euro area have a relatively flat demand curve. And this is so because their central banks have reputation as being inflation targeters and for a long time uh, providing um, inflation within, within the target and in these two economies. And when the demand curve is really flat, shifts on the supply curve are gonna be uh, affecting real activity much more than inflation. Of course, COVID was much more than adverse supply shock. You also had a demand shock in initially, and then over time we had a response of policies and uh, demand and supply uh, shifting and contributing both of them to inflation uh, in, in the two economies. So what I'm gonna do next is to turn to my comments, and as I mentioned, I want you to take it as you know, highlighting a few of the interesting patterns that they find in their estimates and also providing some uh, uh, ideas for future research uh, going forward. I'll start by looking at uh, a comparison between the US and, and the Euro area, but I wanted you to think about, you know, when we look at demand, when we think about demand shocks, we typically have in mind that these demand pressures are stemming mostly from fiscal or the monetary side. Uh, well, monetary policies in the US and the Euro area were much more similar than the fiscal policies in these two economies. So the picture on the uh, uh, left-hand side is showing you real disposable income per capita for the US. Uh, and you know this kind of gives you a flavor of demand pressures, which is basically disposable income for households uh, and consumers to consume. And as you can see, and, and it's not news, um, the fiscal effort and the demand pressures in the US seem much larger, at least stemming from this perspective. The uh, shaded area is the interquartile range across uh, Euro area countries. And I'm keeping the same color scheme that they, that they had in the paper to make it easier to compare. But as you can see, the effort in the US was much larger. My own research before show how this much larger effort actually fed into inflation in the US, driving a lot of the dynamics that we've seen in, in the US. Uh, the picture on the uh, uh, right-hand side uh, adds to the previous one, but shows an additional challenge that we economists have when trying to understand dynamics during COVID. So we typically resort to uh, uh, statistical estimates that look at a long time period and use the past to explain either the future or current conditions. Well, when we look at what happened to US dispo real disposable income per capita in a long time sample, we can see that we are, everything that happened during COVID was not even close to anything that we had in the past. Um, so this is all to say that when we use past relationships to estimate and infer about uh, current, uh, current situation, and you have some big outliers like this in the sample, you may be introducing some bias in the results. Uh, and the reason I highlight this is because I thought it was particularly interesting that in their results they had the contributions of demand being this, nearly the same in the US and the Euro area, when you know you had so such a bigger fiscal effort in the US and you had so such a big outlier or extraordinary conditions in, in the economy. I want to go back to talking uh, about a comparison between the US and the Euro area, but before I do so, I want to take a, a little bit of a broader perspective. So these pictures uh, in this panel compare uh, economic variables in the Euro area, the US, and in Latin America. Um, if I had tried to do this with other uh, compositions of countries, uh, the results were actually not that dissimilar. But I'll, I'll make the point with Latin America for obvious reasons. Um, so 
If we look at the first picture, the top uh, left-hand side picture, we have the fiscal response during COVID in this, these three economies. And as you can see, fiscal uh, uh, demand pressure is stemming from fiscal response, at least from this perspective, was much smaller in Latin America than in the other uh, two uh, regions. Policy rates, the, the top picture on the right-hand side, were aside from a level difference, actually not that dissimilar in terms of the raise uh, in, in policy rates. That said, we know that advanced economies use much more frequently and more intensively uncon unconventional policies, monetary policies, which is something that Latin American countries shied away from. So from the pictures on the top, you can actually uh, think that, or at least infer that, demand pressures stemming from monetary and fiscal policies were a quite a bit lower in, in Latin America relative to the US and, and, and the Euro area. Yet, when we look at the pictures at the bottom, it's surprising that the dynamics of real activity and inflation were very, very similar. I was actually a bit surprised by, by this too. Uh, you saw a rise in inflation and a decline, a sharp decline in real GDP, and then uh, the recovery. So what do we take from this? Uh, it's, it's a bit surprising that you had so different pressures, both stemming, stemming from the demand side at least, but when you look at uh, the outcomes on real activity and inflation, they were very similar. So how to make sense of this? Well, it is possible that there is some global factor or maybe some global driver generating a co-movement across different countries despite very different economic conditions. Uh, and I know that this is something that Kristen is gonna be talking more about tomorrow. But here what I try to do is the following. I estimate a Phillips curve, pretty standard, but I augment this Phillips, this Phillips curve to, by including external factors, external inflation factors and external unemployment factors. Basically, I'm, a, I'm getting a sample, a large sample of countries, extracting principal components and plugging it in in a, in a very standard Phillips curve estimate. And if you look at, and I do that for the US and for the Euro area. And if you look at the picture on uh, the left-hand side, the US uh, picture, the blue, the dark blue bars are the contributions of foreign inflation to dynamics in inflation in the US. And equivalently, equivalently in the uh, right-hand side, you have the contributions of foreign inflation to inflation in the euro area. Uh, and as you can see, it, it's, not, uh, no, it's not trivial, right? You do have some contributions of inflation from abroad actually driving or helping explain some of the dynamics of inflation in the US. It's less so in the Euro area, but I thought it was also very interesting that when we get closer to the end of the sample, more the last two quarters that I have data for, you do have these foreign factors pushing inflation down both in the US and the Euro area. So why am I bringing this up? Well, the reason I'm bringing this up is because a lot of the estimates that we see, this is something that the authors also do in the paper, estimate drivers and components for each country separately. But when you do so, you may be missing some of these uh, cross-country relationships and global factors that may be also helping uh, drive demand pressures and supply pressures. So on top of the difficulties that we already had in estimating and trying to infer uh, current relationships using a past that maybe is very dissimilar from what we currently experienced, we also need to do it in a cross country or maybe a panel, uh, a panel framework. So now I turn to my last point, which is, uh, the result that they show that the, Euro, uh, the ECB 
contributed quite a bit to the economic recovery in the euro area by keeping interest rates low for some time despite the rise in inflation. And this is a picture from their uh, paper as well. And if you look at the brown bars, these are the monetary policy contributions to inflation and to GDP uh, in the US and in the euro area. And as Giorgio highlighted, if you focus on the top picture on the right hand side, you see that monetary, the monetary component of demand shocks contributed quite a bit to uh, the recovery in the euro area. So by keeping interest rates low for some time, despite the rise in inflation, the ECB was contributing to uh, the recovery in, in the euro area. Interestingly, however, when you look at, and this is you know, something that they highlight quite a bit in the paper, and as the focus is the euro area, it, it makes sense to, uh, to do so. But they're estimating for both the US and the euro area. So when you look at the results for the US, it doesn't look like monetary policy, monetary shocks contributed nearly as much to the recovery in, in the US. So I just thought it was really interesting that you know, the results were quite different from that perspective when comparing the US and the euro area. And, and this is something that I, that I think we all need to, uh, to explore. And of course, it has important implications for policy and also lessons about uh, the period that we, uh, we are currently in. So to conclude, uh, this uh, is a great, very careful paper. The authors are, they do a lot of robustness exercise. I highly recommend everybody to read it. Um, the results actually uh, suggest that there are known trivial transmissions of shocks across countries. The authors mentioned that a little bit in the paper, but I think this is something to further explore. And for sure, it raises a lot of their results, uh, raise many questions for uh, future research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fernanda. Uh, and thank you very much to both of you, because you have adjusted your interventions to the time limits, limits that we have set up. Um, I will take advantage of my position today, and I will ask you, one question to both of you. Is inflation a global phenomenon? Looks like it. <laughs> in the sense that inflation is increased in many countries by a very similar amount. Um, Fernanda's graph about Latin America is extremely interesting. I didn't know about it. I didn't expect it. It increased by less because it started uh, at a higher level, but it's nevertheless very interesting. So I think, uh, um, so in the paper we point this out, huh, that there could be a global component this, uh, to this, in the sense that in the paper we make no effort to distinguish between global demand and domestic demand. And that's certainly, I think, the way to go at this point. There is some research that already does that, uh, uh, Shebnem, here, sitting in the audience, there's some papers that uh, um, um, pursue this uh, research agenda. There is a recent paper that I've seen by Hilde Bjorkland with some other researchers at the Norges Bank uh, that decomposes the demand factor into global and, uh, and, and domestic. So this is certainly important. We made no effort to do this, uh, and so I'm totally open uh, to that continuation of the, of the, of the research agenda. Um, I do think there is certainly a global component to it, and this is not since COVID. It's been before. So if you look at a longer uh, historical perspective, you see that there is some type of co convergence and decline in inflation that has been happening worldwide. And, and then COVID just exposed these co-movements becoming more or becoming stronger because you're also seeing in, in a very short period, in a much shorter period, substantial increases and declines in, in inflation uh, across many countries, despite their very different uh, initial economic conditions. Although, if I may say, it is important to distinguish between domestic and global demand factors or global factors in general, but it's gonna be very difficult because uh, it's very difficult to distinguish between a global shock or shocks that are very correlated. At the end of the day, many central banks behave the same. 
Many fiscal authorities behave the same. It's true that maybe the size of the fiscal package in Europe was a little smaller, but the, primary, the increase in the primary deficit to GDP in Europe was about 7% versus the 9% in the US. The nature of the fiscal help was different. Um, Pent-up demand was the same in many countries. A bunch of people came out from the, from the COVID pandemic, wanted to spend more. And so is it global or is it just local but almost perfectly correlated? That's very difficult to tell. It's important, but it's difficult. Okay, uh, now the floor is open. What we are going to do, we are going to collect two or three questions and so you can respond afterwards. Let's see Lucrecia Dor. Uh, very interesting paper. So I think that uh, um, I mean, to, my reading of the paper is that there are two main results. Uh, the first one, well, is that the output loss, so the, I mean, the recovery was weaker in the euro area with respect to the US. I mean, the, the GDP numbers and the investment numbers are much weaker. And uh, the counterfactual, your counterfactual also shows that the cost of this inflation uh, are quite large, okay, for the euro area. So if the ECB had gone much faster in increasing interest rate, the output loss would have been massive, okay? So this, this is one of the main uh, results of your paper. And then in, in, the, in the forecast, uh, you say, well, the ECB now enjoys a credibility bonus uh, so that uh, you can uh, wait and see that inflation will converge to target, so no worry. So the question is, uh, assuming that your analysis is right and so on, what would have happened if the ECB had gone, uh, you know, in a much, with a much more dovish stance? Because after all, this inflation was costly in terms of output. And uh, so how, using your framework, how can we understand the cost of this inflation in terms of output loss? Is, can you consider an alternative path of, uh, you know, much more slow, you know, given the fact that you can enjoy this credibility bonus, although this may be endogenous, but you know, I think it would be interesting to see that. Uh, that Thank you very much. Uh, you have uh, the, the floor there. And afterwards, Philip Lane, and uh, you can respond afterwards. Okay, I thought this was very interesting. Let me put forward, uh, 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 I mean, you have emphasized the shifts in <coughs> supply and demand. Let me put forward a third possibility, which is that in addition to the uh, sh upward shift in supply, there has been not so much a shift in the demand curve, but a change in the slope. Okay, so it has become steeper. And in which case, I mean, the interpretation of that would be that um, the central bank, there has been a, sh a, a, sh a shift in the short run response of the uh, in, in, in the reaction, short run reaction function of the central bank. So it has be become more accommodative than in historically. In which case, an econometric uh, exercise like yours may, miss, may interpret that as a demand shock, as an exogenous demand shock. But, you know, if this is truly what happened, mm -hmm. I think we should think of it not as an exogenous demand shock, but as a, sh a different response of the, of the monetary authority which is, would be consistent also with the deviations that you observe in policy rates relative to what an, an estimated policy rule using historical data would tell you. Because according to these estimated policy rules, you should have expected, given the, the behavior of inflation, you should have, have expected policy rates to reach uh, you know, two-digit uh, numbers. And finally, Philip. <coughs> so, 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 so I, I think uh, the model you use, uh, it, it's because it's such a benchmark uh, model of, of how we model uh, inflation and the economy, it's useful to go through this uh, period uh, using this, if you like, kind of standard uh, model. But let, let me try to map it to, to uh, the, the years in question and then maybe uh, ask a couple of questions. So in 2021, um, for a lot of that year, uh, our monetary policy statement said demand is outstripping constrained supply. So there was clearly, we did identify demand outstripping constrained supply as, as a, uh, one of the factors driving inflation. Uh, and then in 2022, uh, with the pandemic reopening, we were using phrases, basically uh, uh, demand supply mismatches at the sectoral level. So in other words, in 2021, it was seen as, uh, okay, there's a, 
demand is outstripping supply, but supply will catch up. The bottlenecks will ease. And this is essentially a little bit of what Jordi just said. So in other words, in 2021, there's no need to raise rates because supply will catch up with demand and inflation, to coin a phrase, will be transitory. Uh, now, of course, uh, th that's not the way it turned out. And in 2022, uh, we did have the, at the exact same time, we had the Russia-Ukraine war at the same time as the European economy finally reopened on a permanent basis. So for the first six months, or those middle quarters of 22, uh, we had a war on the one hand uh, involved with energy prices, but we clearly had a strong demand recovery in the non-traded sector. Um, so we, we, but in terms of the overall dynamic of inflation, we've clearly said, okay, more of this is coming from the energy shock. Uh, and then on top of that, there is some action in services on that. Okay, so, so my, my questions are, one is you, you, uh, you have this issue, it's hard for supply shocks to generate inflation in this framework. Um, and I, I know that there's other papers like this, but there, there are some other work, and we had last year at the Centra Forum, uh, basically large shocks travel fast. And uh, if you have a different uh, response of pricing, so there's more state-dependent pricing in respect to supply shocks. And uh, you know, one way to convert this is, what was happening is, many firms had this big cost push shock from energy. And uh, they basically said, look, we cannot, we have to raise prices. I don't really care what demand is. I have to raise prices or I'm going bankrupt. Uh, and so that's an example where the cost push shock led to a change in pricing. So it traveled from the, from the supply shock to inflation much more than, than, than normal. And then the third point, which I, I think is uh, already Fernanda raises, uh, it is true the way we set up our kind of analysis is energy is just pr is the forecast comes off the market curve. That market curve reflects the global factors driving as supply and demand for energy. Uh, and uh, when we say demand, we do mean domestic demand. But of course, it does leave out, okay, what's driving uh, the global pressure on energy, the global pressure on tradable prices, like, such as goods prices. So, you know, um, as you say, it's difficult to differentiate domestic demand and foreign demand. Um, but maybe uh, at some point, and I know Chris and Tamara will come back to it, understanding and also how we communicate, because maybe it's also how central banks communicate about, because uh, uh, we, we, we do treat energy prices as this global exogenous variable, uh, but endogenizing energy is, you know, I think in, in some formats uh, quite helpful. Thank you very much, Philip. We have reached uh, our time limit, so I am not going to respect. <laughs> so, but uh, for sure that both of you, you are going to respond rapidly, and we can take, finally, two additional Two additional questions. Okay. Hmm? I'm going to respond in reverse, if that's okay. About your last question, I already said we agree on this distinction between global and domestic. This is next in our uh, research agenda. About the large shocks travel fast, uh, for that explanation to, to be sufficient to, to, to rationalize the, the, the inflation experience, we would need not just the large shocks travel fast, but the large supply shocks travel fast and not demand shocks. Because if all shocks travel fast, this corresponds to a steepening of the aggregate supply. And if the aggregate supply is steeper, changes in the demand curve are even more effective in explaining the, 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 the rise in inflation. Your last point is similar to Jordan's one, so I'm going to address it uh, uh, together. Uh, it, it's absolutely right. So another possibility that I didn't have time to talk about in the presentation, but is evaluated in the paper, is if the aggregate demand, instead of shifting upwards, has rotated during COVID. But the rotation of the aggregate demand during COVID means uh, extra policy accommodation, means that the central bank is responding to inflationary pressures less than it used to. And in the short run, there's really not much of a difference between an upward shift in the aggregate demand or a rotation in the aggregate demand. It's still extra policy accommodation that translates in unexpectedly strong demand. Where it makes a difference is in the medium and long run, because obviously we much prefer a shift in the aggregate demand that goes back to its original position relative to a permanent rotation 
that means that the central bank has become less serious about inflation. But I think our, the last results in our paper show that this hasn't happened. And so that's, that's good. And finally, uh, Lucrezia. Uh, let me, um, oh, what would have happened? So we could compute, based on the model, the opposite counterfactual. So we could simulate what would have happened if the ECB had been more accommodative. So we could do it mechanically. Most likely what would have happened is that inflation would have increased more than it did. By exactly how much we need to do it. But there are reasons, actually Fernanda was pointing this out yesterday at dinner, there are reasons to believe that that type of counterfactual is less reliable than the one we did because if the ECB had been super accommodative, maybe inflation expectations would have completely de-anchored and given that inflation expectations have been anchored in the 20 years of our sample, we would have very little to say about that new regime that we haven't observed in the past. So we could do it but I don't know if we could interpret the results of that uh, exercise uh, um, very carefully. So, thank you. Thank you, Fernanda. Do you want uh, to Just anything? very quickly, Giorgio just stole what I was gonna say about anchoring of inflation of expectations. But I think another point that I wanted to raise is that we typically associate demand pressures with fiscal and monetary policy, but you can also have some other types of demand shifts, shifts in preferences, pent up demand and shifting the behavior of consumers. And probably this is something that we, uh, at least we, we uh, think we experienced during the pandemic, but that's a, a very hard, uh, econometrically, that's very hard to actually quantify. So we, we miss that, that piece of information. Okay, thank you very much, Fernanda. We can take uh, a couple of questions there. It was first. Okay, thank you, uh, Volker Wieland, Great University Frankfurt. Um, so I thought it was very welcome to have this focus on the demand side today. You know, we last year we had more the focus on energy shocks, and uh, uh, but so I think that's good. And uh, but on the other side, I have a general issue with these approaches we've seen. Right, we basically decompose things in many a sequence of many shocks from different directions. That's kind of the perspective of the models. You know, there are many surprises relative to the predictive capacity of the data one uses, you know, inflation and output. But in fact, I would submit there were only two shocks. One shock was the pandemic, and the other shock was the Russian attack on Ukraine. Right? So if we start with the pandemic, then, you know, we have macro pandemic models, macro uh, um, epidemic models, which show you that that m moves demand and supply in the same way down and then up. And then we had very supportive multi and fiscal policies. We took away the income uncertainty from people. So on the uptake out of the pandemic, as the productive capacity was increasing again, we had much more spending than could be uh, provided by that. Um, so I think we need a more structural approach to fully understand it, you know, where things are endogenous. And secondly, I think on this conclusion where you say, oh, things would have been much worse if policy would have, you know, not deviated and waited with the response, but responded earlier, like with these rules that Jordi mentioned. Uh, I'm less pessimistic, because if you think of the pandemic moving potential moving, say, the flex price output gap down and up, right? there is basically a lot to say for demand following supply. And if anything, if you're unhappy with the, with the productive capacity on the way out of the pandemic to uh, work on the supply side policy. So um, basically, I think it would be near optimal to let demand recover along with supply and thereby avoid a lot of this inflation. And I think this comes very much from the trade-offs you put into the model where you say it would have been much worse in terms of GDP. I see a lot of hands, but uh, you know, the last one is close to uh, Francois Benoit. Hmm? And we have to close because we are exceeding our timeline. Hmm? No, thank you very much for the two of you and to Domenico for this very stimulating start of Centra, by the way. It's very stimulating because, Giorgio, if I try to sum up the bottom line, you tell to us two things. First, we were wrong in our analysis of causes, but second, we were right in our policy conclusions. <laughs> uh, 
So how can we reconcile these two sentences? And can you help us? Uh, I, I, see, I see two possible explanations, but I don't feel comfortable with either of them. A, at the end, the analysis of causes does not matter that much. Uh, and this debate about demand is su on supply is partly theoretical. Or B, we were not completely right in our policy conclusions. And when I look at our counterfactual, the first one about tightening earlier, one year earlier, at least in your analysis, does not look that bad. We would have had, if I remember correctly, 3% less inflation and only 1% less GDP. But could you help us to see, to come to more comfortable conclusions? Okay, Giorgio and Fernanda, and we close the session. So, um, about uh, the more structural approach and the presence of only two shocks. So, first of all, there's been research using DSG. I think Domenico was, uh, was telling me research at the Bank de France that uh, obtains very similar results. So, it's not just a more reduced form versus structural. The question is, there were really two shocks. There were certainly two big shocks. But the model, and we certainly take into account these two big shocks in the analysis. But the model, the estimated model, also tells us that the sequence of smaller subsequent shocks accumulate to be important. And so what happened during that period? There was this big contraction in demand, this big contraction in supply, and then a gradual recovery of both. But essentially, we're saying that uh, demand recovered a lot faster than anticipated. It's not so surprising. We've never seen anything like this. We've never seen a pandemic in the sample where people come out after 12, 18 months of not spending in service at all and wanted to go on vacation. And so this is not particularly uh, surprising. About uh, the, the, the question, I'm not sure whether my answer will be will make you more comfortable or not. Um, so at some level, I do agree that the cause of uh, inflation does not matter too much for policy, that the policy based on a Taylor rule would achieve uh, sensible results, but that Taylor rule would need to have output in it. And so the single mandate seems a little bit restrictive to handle situations like the one that we've seen in the last two or three years. Let me stop at that. Fernanda. Um, I think you already answered the, uh, the questions that came up. Very good. We have only exceeded 10 minutes, so it's my fault, no, your, 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 your fault. And, you know, to finalize, you know, uh, because, well, sometimes, you know, the messages are a little bit bittersweet, but uh, the sweet part is that the last mile is going to be very easy. We hope so. <laughs> okay. Hopefully. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>